Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. This time, we have Nintendo Power issue number issue 31 for December of 1991, bringing an end to the magazine's first year. Well, third year, sorry. Oh, how the years blur together. And this issue also has our first Game Boy cover game in the magazine thus far. Let's get started. Our cover game, as mentioned, is our first Game Boy game to make the cover with Metroid 2 The Return of Samus. Although the cover features graphical asset, assets from the NES version in the background. Also, Samus has a very physically awkward pose. She's not wearing the, the boob armor from the poster from earlier, but still, it looks like she's moving to jump or something, but ended up turning her body towards the camera mid-jump. It's one of the more physically uncomfortable action poses I've seen, and I've seen a few. <clears throat> in the letters column, we get readers writing in with what they want in, the, in their ultimate game system, which basically involves people throwing numbers around without knowing what they mean and wanting consoles that are basically robots that also run video games. There's a far more interesting side of the page opposite this, which has a whole bunch of creative gaming-related things people's ha people have done, including a Tetris patchwork quilt and a very nicely done Mario snowman, complete with a sculpted mustache. We also have a selection of envelope art, though we don't get a great look at it. Uh, the games shown this issue are Star Tropics, Dr. Mario, and Battletoads. You know, envelope art is one of the things I really like about video game magazines, and I'm surprised we don't get more fandom-related magazines like Otaku USA, for example, running envelope art. Maybe they're not getting enough, I don't know. Moving into the game coverage, we start off with the NES title Batman Return of the Joker from Sunsoft. The game is, narratively, a follow-up to the Batman movie licensed game, but with visuals which take more of a cue from the comics and which assume that the Joker survived the ending instead of being killed. Aside from being an action platformer like the last game, this title also has a few auto-scrolling shooting stages as well. This game is not fun. The first Batman game had very precise, carefully tuned platforming like you got in the Ninja Gaiden games, or to certain degree the Mega Man games, combined with the urban gothic aesthetics of Tim Burton's movie. This game loses all of that. This is a run-and-gun game that feels almost like it was a reskin of some other title, were it not for the fact that the game's overall aesthetics fit that of the Batman comics. Considering how much I enjoyed the first Batman game, the step down here is a considerable disappointment. Next up is Nestor's Adventures. The tip this time is for Kid Icarus for the Game Boy, with the advice being to move to the left and shoot straight up while, when, while dealing with the tumbling mirrors. Except, if memory serves, in the Kid Icarus games you can only shoot in the direction you're facing, which makes this tip not only useless, but useless and non-factual. In the classified information column, we have a tip for Super Mario World that lets you get eight extra lives through an invulnerability extension on Donut Secret 2. Moving on to one of the SNES titles of this issue with Act Razor. Now this is a launch game I haven't played before. The game Next, we move on to another of the SNES launch titles with Act Razor. Now, this is a game I haven't played before. We get maps of the action levels in the realms of Fillmore, Bloodpool, Cassandora, and Itos. There isn't really any coverage of the god game aspects of the gameplay, though. Act Razor's mix of god game and action platformer is interesting. The platforming elements are nicely done, with great music and creative level design. And then there's the God Game portion of the title. I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to give God Game elements where you're generally hands-off, you just tell people where to go, and they do things on their own, and it's generally kind of vague about how things are done. Uh, it's hands-off. However, it feels tedious here, particularly with having to slowly direct your worshippers over to the monster lairs one square 
at a time. Yes, you can just go shoot all the monsters yourself, but that's also fairly tedious because some of these lairs have hundreds of monsters, so it's faster to have the worshippers go there, but it'd probably be even faster to give the player the option just to go down and have an action stage where they go through the monster lair and kill them and take out a boss monster themselves. It's just lots of busy work telling characters which tiles to build on instead of just being able to give them the order to, okay, build to the monster lair and have them just do it. Sitting down and playing a bunch of Act Razor, I now understand why the god sequences were dropped from Act Razor 2. I'd rather they were tweaked to make them less tedious, but if they couldn't manage to improve on them, I also understand why they were cut. In Counselor's Corner, we have a mix of tips from older NES games and new SNES titles. Of note, there's a secret exit from Cheese Bridge in Super Mario World, and we get instructions on how to find it. We also get a tip for Star Tropics with the frequency you need to use to contact Dr. J in Chapter 4. Now that information is on the letter that you got with the game if you bought it new. However, if you lost the letter, or rented the game, or picked up a copy used, that information is definitely helpful absolutely necessary to proceed in the game. We return to the NES with Ocean's Adams Family. We have maps of some of the early levels of the game, in addition to what sub-levels or levels are where in the hub area. As with the last Ocean game I reviewed, Darkman, this feels a lot like a PC platformer, a bad PC platformer, ported to the NES. Here's the thing. When I look at a lot of PC platformers that get slack cut for them, particularly titles for Ocean, I feel like they get that room for error because at the time, during the 80s and the 90s, a lot of PC platformers didn't have the same graphical depth to them as they did in other genres like simulators and RPGs. Not to saying there aren't good PC platformers. The Commander Keen games are excellent. It's just that I've, PC platformers, particularly ones from, honestly, British companies, particularly ones designed for the, for the specy, are iffy. The platforming is floaty and imprecise, it's hard to handle, and awkward to control. I mean, it's better than an isometric platformer, but by saying that, I am damning the game with faint praise. If you combine these big, floaty, imprecise jumps with some incredibly cheap hits, and you have a platform that is absolute rubbish. And by cheap hits, I mean literally unavoidable hits. And you have a platformer that is absolute rubbish, and I recommend avoiding at all costs. Next up is a Konami-licensed platformer with Tiny Toon Adventures for the NES. With the maps on the poster and the maps in the article itself, we have coverage of pretty much the whole game. Last issue, I talked about the Flintstones platformer and the importance of deciding whether your licensed platformer's physics are going to emulate the genre of the work you're adapting and designing your levels accordingly, or whether you're going to design the level first, use aesthetics from the work in question, and then use physics that work with whatever your design is. Tiny Toon Adventures is a great example of a game which goes with the genre emulation physics route and does it right. The game has a fair amount of inertia in its movement animation. It doesn't necessarily have an uncontrolled slide or skid, but it does have some con continued movement when you release the button of s several character widths. The game's levels are designed with that in mind, so the character or the player isn't expected to do super precise jumps. Additionally, the player is able to select a backup character in the form of Plucky Duck, Furball, or Dizzy Devil, and switch between them when they collect certain items. Each backup character controls a little differently. Plucky can glide if you hold down the jump button. Dizzy has a spin attack, which lets you attack while running, as opposed to having to jump on enemies. And while I didn't play as Furball, quick research shows he's able to climb rows, walls, giving him another alternate traversal ability. The game's levels are very well designed. The game controls very well. The game's main problem is the checkpointing, or rather, the lack thereof. You die, you go back to the beginning of the level. By contrast, in the Mario games, there are mid-level checkpoints that you hit if you get far enough, and if you die, you restart there. Further, the game gives you super mushrooms often enough that you can recover from a cheap hit without too much effort. 
Here, extra hit items, hearts, are rare enough that a single hit can force you to restart the level, which can actually make it a little more difficult to learn from your mistakes. As a game, it's alright, I certainly enjoyed it, uh, I may even pick up a copy at some point in the future, but it can definitely do with some gameplay tweaks. Moving into the Game Boy titles, we have our cover game, Metroid 2 The Return of Samus. This time you're going to the homeworld of the Metroids, SR388, to wipe them out, or at least reduce their numbers. The article has an overall map of the area, plus maps of the first three phases of the planet that you'll go through. Interestingly, to prevent secret breaking, the world is lava that blocks access to certain areas. Defeat enough Metroids and an earthquake will happen, opening up more of the map to explore. So you have to get through so many Metroids in order to progress. I wonder how that affects speedrunning, if anyone speedrunning this game. Metroid 2 is a really good adaptation of the original Metroid's Game Boy to a portable system, and basically doing the thing that you need to do when you make a game portable. Make it something that you can play in chunks. It adds save points to the game, and moves the gameplay from hunting down bosses in fairly large regions of the planet to hunting down and killing individual Metroids. Thus, the gameplay gets moved into a bite-sized form, where the player can decide on one particular sitting to explore until they find the next Metroid, and then kill that Metroid on that outing, or wait till the next. That, combined with using thresholds of Metroid slain to unlock more, from the, more of the map, works great from a gameplay standpoint. The one thing I think this game needs, though, is an auto-map, since, as I've discussed previously, being on the go is not always conductive to drawing your own map and keeping track of where you are on that map. It's the same reason why in the GBA Metroidvania games that the whole map visible through a subscreen. It's definitely the kind of thing where, if we had gotten a remake of this game for the GBA, in the way that we got a remake of the original Metroid in the form of Zero Mission, it would definitely add the experience of the game to add a, a auto-map available through the select menu or what have you, and would certainly make the game more enjoyable. Next is Ninja Gaiden Shadow, which started its life as a Game Boy port of Shadow of the Ninja before Tecmo bought the game and reskinned it into a Ninja Gaiden game. We get maps of the first five stages, with the implication there's more after it. First off, the platforming elements in this game are probably significantly less than those in the Ninja Gaiden series. And by probably, I mean definitely. I mean, there's certainly some platforming here, but I wouldn't describe the platforming as the focus of the game. And instead, the focus is on proceeding slowly forward and setting up your attacks against enemies. Sort of like Dark Souls with ninjas. Speaking of which, why doesn't that exist yet? This doesn't make the game bad by any means, it just it doesn't feel quite like a Ninja Gaiden game. That and the total lack of the cinematic cutscene, cutscenes that made the earlier titles in the, the series stand out. I mean, again, it's not bad, certainly worth playing, definitely a worthy addition to your um, library for the uh, Game Boy, but it's not what I'd call something that feels like a perfect adaptation of the Ninja Gaiden experience on a, plat on a uh, portable platform. Rounding out the Game Boy titles, we have the Game Boy version of Hudson's Adventure Island. We have gameplay notes, but no level maps specifically. This is probably the easiest game of the entire Adventure Island franchise I've played thus far. It is almost a cakewalk. I understand the difficulty for games and portable systems need to be a, needs to be adjusted for on-the-go gameplay. I've even mentioned this specifically myself, where I've encountered games that needed to do this adjustment. However, this is definitely not what I was thinking of. I th almost think developers went too far here. I'm not expecting a controller-breaking level of difficulty, but for an Adventure Island game, there's a certain amount of difficulty they expect from the game. And at the very least, I was expecting to die at least once I made my way to the first island. That didn't happen here. In the classified information column, we have a bunch of tips for Castlevania Adventure 2, including a code to start with 10 lives instead of 3, and secret rooms for all four of the main castles. 
Returning to the Super Nintendo, we now have a guide for Pilot Wings, another SNES launch title. We have notes on the different vehicles that you'll fly, as well as some of the flight lessons you'll run into in early game areas. Much as with Baseball Simulator t um, 1000, I was unable to get this game to work. I'm sorry. I was looking forward to playing this, too, so I'm, I'm bummed out by this. Next up is Peter Molyneux's first game on consoles, albeit a port of a PC game, with Populous. We have notes on the gameplay mechanics and the game interface. I can't make heads or tails of this game's controls. I don't know if this is a situation where the game is unplayable without the manual, or the port is just really that bad, but I can't figure out how to do anything in this game. I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing in the tutorial. Heck, this if this is supposed to be tutorial, it's not telling me anything about what I should be doing. It's, this is just a whole big pile of disappointment. We have the results of the Ultimate Game Boy Design Contest, where readers of Nintendo Power are tasked with basically designing a custom skin for the Game Boy. Of the first Pride Runners, my favorite is, and I'm going to mangle this name, Le Duongs. It feels like something that would go really well with the Game Boy version of Donkey Kong Country had that game been out when this issue came out. On the runner-up side of thing, things, Chris Ellsbury's reminds me of a... a um, visual motif I saw a lot on Nintendo promotional products from back in the day. In particular, a pair of Nintendo tennis shoes I had when I was in, like, kindergarten or first grade. Yes, yes, I ha had a pair of Nintendo tennis shoes. There's a reason why I'm doing this show. In the now playing column, Paperboy 2 has come to the NES as well, along with another Capcom uh, licensed Disney game with Tailspin. In the top 30 column, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, The Manhattan Project, which I'm not sure is out yet, has entered the list. In the Celebrity Profile column, we have another less well-known, though still active and somewhat well-known person, with Mayim Balik, whose name I also have mangled, and I apologize, who at this time is star of the TV show Blossom. She has gone on to get her doctorate in neuroscience before returning to acting to play the neuroscientist Amy, Dr. Amy Fowler on The Big Bang Theory. Wrapping up this issue, in the Pack Watch column, we have another Simpsons game on the way with Bart vs. the World, along with the next installment in the Mega Man franchise with Mega Man 4, and on the SNES front, we have a 16-bit version of Super Off-Road, along with the Super Nintendo version of of Smash TV. For my picks of this issue, I'm going with Metroid 2 on the Game Boy. With something like the Super Game Boy or Game Boy Player or the Retron 5, I think the game would work incredibly well for at-home play. I'm not sure how well it would work on the go, though, in terms of drawing your own maps and keeping track of where you are on them. Um, for a close second, I would definitely give ActRaiser. Um, so, next issue, we get an overhaul of the look and feel of the magazine. And, well, we didn't get a, a Nestor's Award towards this year, so we'll see what happens with uh, next year. And, other than that, well, at the time this episode goes out, my 24-hour live stream for Extra Life is imminent. So... Now is as good a time as any to head to the link below for my Extra Life page and donate money to help Dornbecker Dorn Children's Hospital. All money donated will go directly to help Dornbecker, so definitely help uh, chip in. Additionally, if you want some in a day's entertainment, please feel free to check out my live stream on my Twitch channel on November 7th. Link again will also be below in the show notes. So, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.